thanks for joining us today. We're going to come to service as we normally do with the time of worship. We're fixing our eyes on God. Lift your voices. Lift your hearts with us. Let's sing out with all we have. Give the praise that he's worthy of today. Here we go.
as your Lord and Savior, we encourage you to participate in this with us and take some of the elements and hold on to them for just a few moments and then in a little bit we're going to take them all together. So let's take some time, some reflective time right now, just really searching your own heart, letting God do that inner work in you right now.
how he willingly gave himself. He allowed his body to be beaten. He allowed his blood to be poured out for our sins. And even though right here this morning, it really only takes in reality a few moments of our time, the remembrance should never end. The remembrance should go with us wherever we go. The remembrance should be that, that looking glass that we see through everything in our life through. Our work, our home, our family, whatever situation, the remembrance of what Jesus did should always be there. And we should see everything in our lives. That's what makes us different as Christians. Is that everything in our lives we see through this through what Jesus did for us. And so we remember you, Jesus, right now and every day of our lives with the bread in your hand. Jesus, we remember you. On that day, Jesus took the bread, he broke it. He said, take this and eat and do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember him right now as we eat of the bread. Thank you, Jesus. The cup in your hand. The same manner he took the cup. He said, this is a cup in the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. thank you. And we remember you. We remember what you did on that cross thousands of years ago, knowing that we would be here right now worshiping you. And so we worship you right now because only you are worthy. Only you are worthy of our praise and our honor. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
worshiping with us, for lifting your hearts and your voices. I love these weeks where we can come together and take communion as a body of believers, remembering the amazing price that Christ paid for us. That alone is reason to worship him with all that we have. Amen. Amen. He's good. He's here. He's faithful. He's ready to meet each of us right where we are, to speak to our hearts, to change lives, to set the captives free as we just sang. Just be open to what he has for you today. As we continue with our service, uh, I'd like you to ask you to do us a favor. And if you just step outside your comfort zone, maybe just a little bit, find a new face. Somebody you haven't met before, you can turn around, shake their hand, give them a high five, introduce yourself to them. And you can sit down when you're done. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, Radiant Church. It's great to see you here this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning here in Colorado. And God is good. He is. He's always good all the time. Amen? Amen. You know what? It doesn't matter what our circumstances look like in our lives. It doesn't change the fact that he's good. And he's got his heart for you. His mind and his thoughts are towards you. And he always has something good that he wants to show and bring into your life. So it's great that we get to be here just worshiping him this morning together, collectively. We never want to never want to miss these moments. Never want to do that. Now, if you are newer to Radiant Church, maybe it's your first, second, maybe your third time uh, with us here today, if you would do us a quick favor and grab one of these connection cards. It's right in the back of the seat there, and you can take just a few moments to fill that out. At the end of service, we're going to be receiving today's tithes and offerings, and at that point, you can just place this in the bucket when it goes around, and, uh, and we would love to just be praying for you by name. Um, for anything that's going on in your life. And there is a place on the back for prayer requests, so we'd love to pray for you about, uh, about those things. And uh, we're truly honored that you're here uh, worshiping with us this morning. So please know that, that that touches us deeply, knowing that you chose to be with us here this morning. Uh, something to bring to your attention. First of all, if you are a member of Radiant Church, this Wednesday is our annual business meeting. So please plan on being there if you're a member of Radiant Church. And also, if you're not a member, you're welcome to come. And you're welcome to come and hear about what God's been doing in the church and where we're going and, and what God has in store still to come. Um, so that's going to be an exciting time. And then also, if you look in your bulletin on the, on the left-hand side, on the very bottom, at the end of the annual business meeting, at the conclusion, we're actually going to be having a reception here where we get to honor and celebrate 10 years of serving here for Pastor Todd and Kelly at Radiant Church. How exciting is that? Isn't that awesome? So we get to honor them with that. In fact, are they here? They are here. There he is. We're going to have them come up here, and we're going to honor them. Let's hear from Pastor Todd right now. I missed the 830, and I think Kelly's going to miss this one. We just got back. That's okay. Uh, look at this. Look at this. And you guys don't need to stand. Thank you. We want to we want to pray for Pastor Todd and Kelly um, here, and and you know what? I think almost I think everyone in this room has been blessed by by this couple and their ministry. Amen. And so we want to see God's hand of blessing and favor to continue to rest upon them as they continue to guide Radiant Church uh, where God has it. So would you pray with me right now as we just lift them up in prayer? Father, we thank you so much, God, for the Hudnalls for bringing them here for such a time as this and bringing Radiant Church into this new season, into this new place that you've called Radiant Church to walk. And so right now, God, we just, we thank you, we praise you. God, we speak your protection and provision to rest upon them. God, Holy Spirit, empower them to continue your work of the ministry here. And the part that they play, God, let it, let it be filled with your power, with your presence. Let them be guided by you continually. Holy Spirit, I just pray just a fresh anointing upon them, God, as they go forward, God, leading this church in ways of holiness and righteousness and walking in your ways, shining a light in this world. And so, Father, right now, we just speak that blessing and that favor to rest upon them as they continue their ministry here. God, let your anointing be upon them as they come here to share in this message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Today we're beginning a new series of teachings here at Radiant Church called Happily Ever After. Obviously, this is a series on marriage. We're also going to be talking about singleness quite a bit, but also relationships. And so I think this series is going to help all of us improve our relationships. Is that me? I'm so sorry. I was in the restroom talking to Chastity and had no idea how late it was. <laughs> so sorry, honey. All right. Anything else so. you wanted to do? Do you have some coffee? What a... <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> Should we pray again? You think Let me just to? say that I know that there's some of you that are extraordinarily excited about this series, and it's the married women. You're all very excited about this Woo! series. Yeah. Because I know that women have a very high value in improving and growing in their marriages. That's evident by the fact that the vast majority of the marriage books sold are sold to women. But I think Radiant Church is a little different. And we have godly men who have a great desire to grow their marriage and have better marriages. Amen. That was so incredibly weak. We have weak. a few. Guys, over I here threw you a softball section. pitch right up the middle. Come on. There we go. There we go. That was awesome. I also realize that there are some of you here and many of you that are single. And we're going to be addressing the subject of singleness. I think this series is going to be very helpful to you on a weekly basis. But particularly, we're going to put a lot of emphasis into that next week. Then there's also some of you, when this subject is brought up, Maybe you came in and you thought, oh, man, I didn't realize this was going on. I wouldn't have come today because there's a lot of woundedness with this. There's a lot of pain. Maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you've gone through some really painful experiences in the area of relationships and marriage, and you would really rather not be part of this series. Now, I want to let you know that we believe that the Scripture is what we have to teach, and sometimes... Hearing the scripture can bring some pain, but it also ultimately brings healing mm -hmm. and brings wholeness. And I believe that Jesus Christ is going to bring healing into people's lives through this series. And finally, um, I know there's marriages here that are on the brink. That there are some people here who your marriage is not doing well, and you've even considered divorce. And I want to let you know that we have a large number of people, well over 100 people, who are weekly and regularly praying for this series, that God is going to use it to do miracles in marriages. And we're yes. believing for that. Listen, last week was Easter weekend where we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And if God raised Jesus from the dead, he can certainly resurrect dying and dead marriages. Amen. So it's going to be a great Amen. series. Well, Todd and I will be celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary in a couple of weeks. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've been doing a lot of reminiscing and talking about the most important things that we've learned during our first 25 years. And so we're excited to be able to share some of the things that we've learned. Some of them have been painful experiences that we've learned and, and grown through. And so it's exciting for us to be able to share those with you so that hopefully you won't have to go through some of the things that we've gone through. But after 25 years of marriage, Todd and I can honestly and confidently testify to you of the blessings, the benefits of marriage, and the fact that happily ever after isn't a myth, it isn't a fairy tale, it's not a pipe dream, it's not something that can only be experienced and uh, lived out by a few rare couples, it is, in fact, attainable for every man and every woman that enters into marriage, if we'll do it God's way, and if we'll put him first. So that's what we're going to talk about over the next four weeks. So whether you're single, married, divorced, happily married, unhappily married, God's plan for marriage is not only that your marriage would be good, but that it would be great. Mm -hmm. And it is attainable, even if your marriage is not so good 
right now. And as Todd mentioned, we realize that there are some of you here today in a crowd this size that you're struggling because not only is your marriage not so good, but you would say, I'm miserable in my marriage right now. And God didn't intend people to be miserable in marriage. He expected us to live happily ever after. So often, a problem in marriage is expectations. We have these unrealistic expectations about what marriage is going to be like. And so often at the beginning of a marriage, there truly is a honeymoon period where everything seems to be candles and excitement and wonder, and then over time, it begins to change. It's like one man I heard about. He said, when I first got married, my dog barked and my wife brought me my slippers. Now my dog brings my slippers and my wife barks. Now I understand, Todd's not the one who said that. <laughs> I'm just quoting other sources. But I do want you to know that the expectations we have for marriage are many times not realistic, and I think we all know what that's like. You know, he comes into marriage and he says, uh, she's going to provide a second income. And her expectation is, he is going to be the sole provider for the family. Or he says, we're always going to be passionate. And she says, we're always going to be romantic. Or he says, she's going to clean the house and she's going to always take care of the kids. And she says, he is going to help me with all the house chores and we are together going to raise our children. So there's different expectations that people have going into marriage. And so often that leads to conflict and problems. And these different expectations that we have, these high expectations that are not realized and met early on in marriage can cause a lot of heartache. In fact, in Proverbs 13, 22, it says, unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick. And some people are heart sick in their marriage because their expectations are unfulfilled. In fact, some people feel like marriage is indeed, as Kelly said, miserable. I heard a silly story about a woman who goes to a wizard, and she says, there's been a curse on my life the last 30 years. Is there any way that you can get it off of my life? And the wizard said, I might be able to, but I need to know the exact words that were declared over you when this curse came into your life. And she said, I can tell you exactly what they were. I now pronounce you husband and wife. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's how some people feel that that was the beginning of the end. That's when things got bad. And that is not at all what God intended. God intended marriage to be a blessing and not a curse. And God has a wonderful plan for our marriages. And during this series, we want to reveal God's will, God's purpose through his word for what marriage can be like. So for those of you who are single and desire to be married, should we have, you have them all stand up? No, so just go can... right ahead. We want to help you count the cost and make right choices before you marry so that when you enter marriage, you will, you'll be ready, you'll be prepared, and you'll have a better, um, a better chance of seeing a great marriage much quicker. And for those of you who are unhappily married, we want to help you work towards the attainable goal of achieving a great marriage. For those of you who are already happily married, I see some, many of you out there, we want to celebrate your marriage and the fact that you're experiencing God's plan, God's heart for you and for your family. And we also want to ask you to come alongside of those couples that are struggling or those singles that need older married couples who can help walk them through even the selection process. We want to ask you to be a mentor or a disciple, di discipler to others. And then for those of you who may be here and you would say, I'm not married and I don't plan on getting married. Well, we want to ask you to join with us, pray for and support God's plan for marriage and the family. Because at Radiant, we are passionate about building strong marriages and strong families because that is the heart of God. Which leads us to number one. And that is this, that a great marriage is God's plan. We said a great marriage is God's plan. Genesis 2.24 and Ephesians 5.31 says this, 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in the earth, and then he created mankind, and the Bible tells us he created them male and female, and he established the sacred union of marriage between a man and a woman. Marriage began in God's heart. So it's important for us, if we're going to have marriages that are happily ever after, we have to go back to the original plan and the one with whom that plan originated with, which is Almighty God. He is the designer and the creator of marriage. In recent years, our society has shifted more and more away from the blessings and the benefits and God's intention for marriage, and we've moved more and more towards relationships without the commitment of marriage. And we're gonna be talking about why that is devastating to, to mankind, to people, to children, to families, to, to mankind, the human race as a whole. But one of the major explanations for this shift in our society is the shift in understanding the original purpose for marriage. So you might wanna take notes here. In his book, The Meaning of Marriage, Tim Keller explains that the original purpose of marriage was first to build character in us. That's the first one. So you may want to get your pen out and take a note there. To build character in us and two, to create community. It's that whole concept of the two becoming one as we learn to die to selfishness and come together for unity and oneness. Yet sadly today, marriage has become more about me. And many in, in our modern day times that we live in have now termed it the me marriage. It's no longer about community, about us denying ourselves and coming together as one. It's no longer a man and a woman with God at the center. Now it's all about me. It's about what I want, what I need, how you can come and fulfill, complete me, fulfill me, help me to fulfill my goals, my dreams, my, my vision. And unfortunately, what that leads to is when the other person stops meeting your needs, fulfilling your expectations, your goals, when they stop living up to what you expected from them, then we call it quits. We say, I'm done, I'm out of here. I'm gonna go find someone else who can complete me and fulfill my needs. Now, the thing that is so important for all of us to understand, married or single, is this. The only one who can fulfill you, the only one who can complete you and satisfy the deepest longings and desires within you is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. It's Christ and Christ alone. So we, each one of us, must find our true identity in Jesus Christ. And then and only then are we truly ready to enter into a marriage that can be happily ever after. So I appreciate that. Marriage is in fact designed by God to glorify God and to fulfill his purposes through the sacred union of a husband and a wife. And when this original design is fully embraced, the result is a marriage that can and will become and remain happily ever after. The lie that marriage is all about me and how you can fulfill and complete, complete me is one of the greatest destroyers of the institution of marriage. So it's important that we expose that lie, deal with it, get rid of it, and replace it with the truth that we find in the heart of God. So one more thing that I wanna point out, and I wanna speak specifically to those of you who are singles here today. If you're single and a passionate follower of Jesus Christ, the main reason, really the only reason you should marry another person is if by marrying that person, you can better fulfill the will of God for your life and together bring greater glory to him. Right. That's it. And when you hear the lie, the lie many times also comes out this way, marriage is to make me happy. But we realize marriage isn't primarily about making us happy. Marriage is primarily about making us holy. The best book I've ever read on that is a book uh, by uh, a guy named Thomas called Sacred Marriage. 
It's a phenomenal book, but he brings that out again and again, that the intention of marriage is to make us not happy, but to make us holy, and happiness is a byproduct. That comes when our priority starts with being made holy. Mm -hmm. Some people think about that in a greater, more general way with God, that God's purpose and plan is to make me happy when really God's purpose and plan is to make us holy, to make us more like Jesus, to make us more Christ-like in our character, in our conduct, in the way we live. Now, I want you to go back and think about the creation narrative. As you read through it, you keep hearing after God creates something, it's good. It's good. It's good. And then finally you hear, it's not good. And it's not good when God creates man in his image. And he says, it's not good that man or mankind should be alone. And there's a very important principle there. And that is that we were not created for isolation. We were created Mm -hmm. for community. We were created for one another. One of the worst punishments anyone could ever receive One of the worst tortures anyone could receive is to be put in isolation, to be put in solitary confinement. That's considered a horrible punishment. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that it is such because we were made for each other. We were made for relationship. We were made for community. And realize that God is a God of community because we've been made in his image. That's why we need and crave community. If you remember, again, in the Genesis narrative, God says, let us make man in our image. Now, who's the us? The us certainly isn't the angels. Never, anywhere in the Bible does it say that angels were agencies of creation. Only God is the agent of creation. So when he said, let us, he's talking about Trinity. Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image. God has always been in community because God is three in one. And God had fellowship within the Godhead. And he created us for fellowship. And loneliness is a painful thing. Loneliness is not what God intended for us. And one of the keys to marriage, one of the deep needs that marriage fulfills is community, is relationship. You need not be lonely anymore because God has brought someone else into your life. And so a foundation of marriage is friendship. If you're a single person looking to marry someone, one of the highest priorities of that is to find someone who's your friend, to marry your best friend. And I am so grateful that I was able to marry my best friend. Kelly and I are best friends. There's no one else in this world I would rather spend time with than Kelly. If I'm somewhere and see something extraordinary, the person I want seeing it with me is Kelly. We're best friends. And that's how it ought to be. And I encourage you to always remember that And because of that, if you, in your life, and you're a married person, if you have someone in your life who's a better friend to you than your spouse, there's an issue. There's a problem. That's not how God intended it. And it's a serious issue if it's someone of the opposite sex. Because in marriage, you should be best friends. Now, as I said, there's another part to that, and that is our maturity, our growth are being conformed to the image of Christ, and we need each other for that. God has brought us together to help us to grow one another into the image of Jesus. And the reason that is so effective in marriage is because the other person you spend so much time with, and you're committed to them. It tells us over in the book of Proverbs that iron sharpens iron among friends. The friends should be that way. We should sharpen each other. We should strengthen each other. And we need other people in our life because there's things we don't know. There's things we don't see. I have blind spots. I couldn't see otherwise. But someone else can point them out to me. They can hold me accountable. They can admonish me in certain areas. They can point out areas where I need to grow. Now, here's what I've seen over the years. The church should practice the ministry of admonition to one another. But some people don't want to be admonished. And I've seen that numerous times. I am thinking of one specific person that I have in mind right now who's going to remain nameless, but I know this individual has areas of their life where they need to grow and develop, and they've been confronted more than once, but every time they're confronted over the issues, they go into isolation. They hide. They don't want to talk to you uh, because they don't want to deal with their issues. Here's the wonder of marriage. When you're married, you're committed to one another, and you can't get away. Mm -hmm. They're there in your life, and they are going to help you to grow. 
And God intended marriage that way so that you can have someone who knows you and loves you anyway. Someone who accepts you and is there for you and committed to you so you know they're truly speaking the truth in love and Mm -hmm. they're going to help you grow into all things in Jesus Christ. And that is one of the great values and purposes of marriage. And our next point, number two, is a great marriage requires commitment. In Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. Todd and I can stand before you today and honestly, authentically, express to you that the greatest commitment that he and I have ever made, the greatest decision we've ever made in our lives besides our commitment to follow Jesus has been our commitment to one another, to love each other, to be there for for each other for a lifetime. And the reality is this, that every great commitment comes with a cost Mm -hmm. or a price to pay for every follower of Jesus Christ. Our commitment to follow Jesus required each of us to pay a price. It required that we surrender our rights, we surrender control of our life, and we give it over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It required major changes. When you and I came to Jesus Christ, there was a price to pay. There were changes that that were necessary. We could no longer think like we used to think or live like we used to live. We no longer went to the places we used to go. There were major sacrifices and changes, but it was for the good. It was for our freedom, our enjoyment, the blessings that that God wants to pour out upon us. But there were changes and sacrifices that were necessary. And marriage was designed by our creator to be a beautiful image of the relationship between Christ and the church, his bride. Christ who willingly sacrificed, laid down his life and died for us, the church. And then we, the church, who willingly surrender our rights and our lives to him for his glory. Isn't that a beautiful mirror of our relationship with Christ, with the relationship in marriage? Now. I want to talk about something that is so important that we all understand. First of all, love, true love, is not a feeling. You do know that, right? So why don't you say that with me? Love is not a feeling. Go ahead. Love Love is is not not a a feeling. feeling. It's not an emotion. You don't fall in love today and then out of love tomorrow. If that's, that's pseudo love, that's false love, that's not true love. True love is a choice. It's a commitment. True love says, I choose you to walk with you, to be with you, to be by your side, to be loyal to you, to be there for you, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, till death do we part. That's true love. Mm -hmm. Love is not a feeling. The the kind of... uh, Well, the world's view of love is really, it's all about feelings. It's about emotions. It's about the fireworks and the sparks and the the passion, the thrill, the excitement, the sex. That's the world's perspective of love. Now, the kind of committed love that God calls us to that brings the deepest, richest, most satisfying relationship and blessing is not devoid of passion, but it's different. It's so much better. Mm -hmm. And that's why today we would plead with every one of you to cling to God in his way. I think often of Jesus' words when he said, narrow is the way that leads to life and only a few find it. Broad is the path that leads to destruction, but God says choose life. You know, to the world, God's way looks very narrow, but the reality is it's the only way that leads to life. It's the only way that leads to true blessing and, and true, committed, enduring love. Now, I want to make clear 
that biblical love, enduring love, God's plan for marriage is not devoid of passion, not by any means, but it's not infatuation, it's true love. You know, this morning we, <laughs> we were getting ready for the 8.30 service and I was telling our kids, Faith and Luke, that Miss Melissa is going to take you back to the offices after communion and worship. And our 10-year-old Faith went, phew, oh, I'm so thankful because I didn't want to hear about all that lovey-dovey, woochy woochy stuff. <laughs> and it made me think of recently Todd bought me some new perfume. And so I put the perfume on and then um, you married couples may want to know what the perfume is later. <laughs> Maybe I'll post it on Facebook. So he got me this new perfume, I sprayed it on and he could not keep his hands off of me. <laughs> He was like a, an animal, just all over me, kissing me, <laughs> woochy woochy. <laughs> and our 10-year-old Faith said, Dad, stop it. This feels like a bad TV show that you wouldn't let us watch. <laughs> so even after 26 years and four months, the passion is there, but it's so much deeper and richer and sweeter. He's still laughing. <laughs> He's probably sitting there thinking, we got to go home and get some of that perfume. Oh. <laughs> um, but <laughs> laughter doeth good like a medicine. Um, do you remember what you were talking about? Oh, yeah, about? I do. Okay. I'm just waiting. So I think back to 26 years ago and the first time that Todd held my hand. Oh, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. I mean, sparks, fireworks. My whole body was tingling. Now, I can tell you 26 years and four months later, I don't have that same. <laughs> she lost. But, <laughs> that love and feel. I mean, if she can sing, I can sing too. But I will tell you this, the passion we have now is so much better. Because back then, I didn't really know him, and he didn't really know me. But now, 26 years and four months later, we know each other thoroughly. And we have been through innumerable burdens, trials, mountains, valleys. We've repented to one another, forgiven one another, been reconciled to one another over and over and over again. There's certainly passion in our marriage, but the passion we share now is different from the thrill that we had then. So when the thrill is over, one thing I cannot stand to hear is when someone will come to me and say, well, I just don't love him anymore. Love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. Love is a commitment. And the only way that we get to experience the good stuff, the really good stuff, the deep passion, the enduring love, is when we choose to make a commitment. Only a committed love can reach the fullest potential of God's heart for marriage. So we have to throw out the world's view of marriage that says, I'm committed to you as long as you live up to my expectations. As long as I feel in love with you, as long as you make me happy and complete me, I'm committed to you. But once you don't, all bets are off. Mm -hmm. We've got to get rid of that idea. That's from the pit of hell. It's one of the great destroyers of marriage. And this was and is a major key for Todd and I in the success of our marriage. When we entered into marriage, we made the decision divorce would not be an option for us. And there were times early on in our marriage when we didn't feel like being married. I like to call them the wonder years because, <laughs> because in the beginning, you don't fully know each other. You're just, you know, you fall in love with the idea of who that person is. And then, because we're imperfect people, once we're married, we realize, oh, you know, if we go from the wonder and the awe to, I wonder what I was thinking. <laughs> I wonder why I did this. Um, 
but that was a long time ago. And because we had made a commitment that divorce wasn't an option for us, we made the decision to pay the price to work through the hard times, the conflict, and today we have a beautiful, wonderful, rich relationship that has grown sweeter and sweeter through the years. The reality is that longevity studies have proven that if a marriage that is struggling today will make a commitment, if a couple will make a commitment that they're going to pay the price and do what's necessary to work towards a happy marriage, within approximately three years, they will have a happy marriage, a healthy marriage. And there's a couple uh, in our church right now. They were at the 945 service this morning. Jose and Mari Guzman. I remember several years ago on a Wednesday night, I walked into the foyer and Jose and Mari were sitting on the steps together and they looked very troubled. I walked over and I said, hey guys, what's going on? And they opened up and shared with me that their marriage was in serious trouble. And they said, we don't know what to do. We've tried to make it work. We're, we feel like we're almost hopeless. And I sat with them on these steps out here, and I, I prayed with them. And I said, are you willing to do what it takes to turn this around and see your marriage become great? And they said, that's what we want. And so they went through that process. They found, I connected them with a, an older couple in the church who walked through those those tumultuous years with them, and today they have a beautiful, loving, happy marriage. So much so that Ma, they told me recently, they said, we want to partner with Art and Joe, and we want to do a group starting in May so that we can walk alongside of couples that are now where we were then. So if that's you today, remember that and get connected. Get connected in uh, the Guzman's and the McLean's group for married, married couples that are struggling. They've been there, they've been through it, and they can walk you through it to a happy, healthy marriage. And God's plan for marriage is one man for one woman for one lifetime. But we all know a lot of times it doesn't work out that way. Malachi 2.16 from the Good News says, I hate divorce, says God. Make sure that you do not break your promise to be faithful to your mate. Divorce is painful and destructive. It separates families, it hurts people, and it's destructive to society. God hates divorce because of the damage it does to people and the damage it does to society as a whole. However, God loves people. Mm -hmm. And that's why he hates divorce and he wants to see people's lives made whole and made well and made sound. And I think most people who've been through a divorce also hate divorce. They know the damage of it. They know the consequences of it. They know the damage to children and the damage to finances and the issues of various kinds that it causes. But divorce is far too common today in our society. Now I do realize, and please hear me out on this, that sometimes there's such abuse or neglect or whatever it may be that it's almost impossible for a marriage to continue. I recognize that, but I'd have to say that's the very small minority of cases. The majority of time when people get a divorce is just over issues like compatibility, or they say, well, we're just not compatible, or it's just not working out, or we're tired of trying. All of these excuses without really recognizing that marriage is a commitment. And it's critical that we understand that. We must be committed to our marriages. I've even heard of marriages where they start off and they say this is a startup marriage. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to change and I'm going to evolve over time and then we'll get a divorce and I'll get someone who's better for me at that time. That is never going to work if you want to have a healthy, whole, biblical marriage. It just doesn't work that way. And understand that when we talk about commitment in marriage, commitment is always a process. It happens over time. I mean, you look at all the other possibilities and say, I die to every other possibility and I choose this one. That's what you do in marriage. You don't go into it lightly. You don't go into it flippantly. You consider the options and you say, this is the one for me. I am now committed to this one. 
And in order to make that kind of commitment, there's a cost involved. Now, our third key and our last is that a great marriage is attainable. But to have that great marriage and to attain it is going to require commitment and it's going to require a price, a cost. Over in Luke 14, 28 to 29, Jesus had some very interesting statements to make. This is from the Living Bible. But don't begin until you count the cost. For you who would begin construction of a building without first getting estimates and then checking to see if it has enough money to pay the bills. You know, when I decided to get married, I knew it was going to cost me something. It was going to cost me my freedom. It was going to cost me financially. It was going to cost me in various ways initially. And I knew that that was going to be the cost, but I felt it was well worth it for Kelly. I'm willing to pay that price. And it certainly has been well worth it. After 25 years of marriage, um, I, I have grown deeper and deeper in love with this man. He truly is the other man of my dreams. Jesus is first and Todd is second. Um, and I can absolutely say that I believe that we are a match made in heaven. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> but I think about the early years and I think, so is thunder and lightning. <laughs> So we're 26 years into our relationship. It wasn't always so sweet. Early on when we got married, you see, we both came from such different um, upbringings. I came from a family where we communicated. If there was a disagreement, you didn't just push it under the rug or go retreat and hope it would just go away. You dealt with it. How many of you have heard from families like that? So we communicated. And we communicated with passion and with emotion. And we would get louder and louder. And as the other one got louder, you would get louder until it was ridiculous. But that's what I had known for 23 years. That's what I grew up with. Sorry, mom and dad, if you're watching today. <laughs> and Todd grew up in a family that was very peaceful and quiet and calm. And often his dad wouldn't deal with conflict. He would retreat and not communicate. So that's what he grew up with. So thunder and lightning is a really good description of our early years. So I'll just give you a glimpse into the Hudnall Parsonage back all those years ago. I've often thought, boy, if the church would have had a hidden camera in the parsonage, they would have been really, been, they really would have been praying for the marriage of their pastors. <laughs> Because what would happen is Todd and I would have a disagreement. He would retreat into isolation and not want to communicate. So I, I feel your pain, those of you who are married to someone who does that. And I, on the other hand, I would slam doors. And I thought, the more doors I can slam, the harder I can slam them, the louder I can slam them, eventually he's going to have to come out. And he's going to have to put on his boxing gloves and fight it out. And so that's what I did. And I remember one day in our first year of marriage, um, he had really upset me and he wouldn't talk about it. And so I was doing this. I slammed doors so hard, the pictures fell off the wall and broke. And eventually he came out. And I was like, all right, buddy, come on, come on. We're gonna fight this out. And he walked over to me, he grabbed me squarely and he said, woman, I've had about enough. And he kissed me hard on the lips, and he took off on a prayer walk. <laughs> that day, I learned that a soft answer turns away wrath. I melted. I fell to the floor in our kitchen just weeping. God, I'm so sorry. But that, that was um, the early years. We learned to deal with conflict in a healthy way. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about through this series, how to communicate, how to have healthy conflict resolution. By the way, in Rad Moms this Tuesday, Jim Kretschmann is coming to talk to us about how to teach our kids healthy conflict resolution. But um, we're going to be talking about emotional intimacy and sexual intimacy. So if you have small children, this may not be the best series to have them in here for. You may want to put them in kids' church. Uh, you don't want them to hear the lovey-dovey, woochie-woochie stuff. Um, but where was I going with all that? Here's where I was going. So 
We knew early on that, Todd, that God had brought Todd and I together. We knew that this was the will of the Lord, that together, because we were both passionate followers of Jesus Christ. What happened with me is I was radically saved out of a, a lifestyle of total rebellion against God. And um, I mean, I had like a Saul of Tarsus conversion. I was just, I went from being a passionate sinner to a passionate lover of God. And that's never diminished one tiny bit in my life. I am deeper and deep, I fall deeper and deeper in love with Jesus, with God, and with Todd. And that is the sweetest and best way to live. But early on, um, I, was, I was praying, God, just give me a friend who loves you like I love you. Because I had friends that said they were Christians, but the, the fruit wasn't there. You know, they were still sleeping with their boyfriends and partying and doing, doing drugs and thinking that they were following Jesus. And I was so desperate for someone who, who really loved him and wanted to passionately follow him. So I began praying, God, just one friend. Just give me one friend like that, and, and, and I'll stop asking. And that's when Todd stepped into my life, my best friend then, and he, he has become even a better friend through the years. But so when, when we met each other and knew that God had called us together, I naively, I don't know what Todd thought, but I naively thought, you know, we're passionate followers of Christ, we're both called into full-time ministry, this is gonna be a breeze. Marriage is gonna be easy for us. Did you think that? I thought it would be easier than it was. <laughs> So, so what I want to communicate today is marriage at times can be hard work, but we promise you it's worth it. It's worth it. So, so pay the price, do what's necessary, have the commitment, the prayer, the selflessness, and the humility that's necessary to build a hap marriage that's happily ever after. And a lot of the reason it is hard is because remember, we're called to become one flesh. And that is an event, but it's also a process. When you are married at the ceremony, at the commitment to one another, at the decision to be married, you then are one flesh. But then there's the process of working out one flesh. And whenever I hear that, I always think of someone's analogy. And they said this, marriage is a lot like making mashed potatoes. Two individual potatoes are skinned alive and thrown into hot water. They stay there and sweat it out together in intense heat. After an insufferably long period of time, the cook takes a masher and crushes them until you can't tell one from the other. They look alike. They taste alike. They talk alike. They act alike. They are one, one flesh. flesh. So how many of you feel like you're in hot water today? Because that's becoming one flesh. It's like the man I heard on his 50th anniversary say, to my lovely wife, and whom I've had 34 wonderful years of marriage with. Now, he wasn't very smart, but he was very honest. Because some years are harder than others, some days are harder than others, and some of them don't always feel wonderful, but that's part of the process of becoming one flesh. And you say, well, if we're really in love, if it's really God's choice for me, then wouldn't it be easy? Well, that's a good question. But really, when has anything worthwhile ever been easy? And I don't care how good of an athlete you are. I think this is the best analogy I've ever heard of this. I don't care how good of an athlete someone is. It's going to take practice, preparation, and effort to learn to hit a 95-mile-an-hour fastball. Uh, I don't care how good of a runner someone is. It's going to take a lot of practice and effort to run a sub-four-minute mile. Because anything of significance takes practice and effort and trial and error and working on it, and marriage is no different. You have to work on your marriage. You have to work at becoming one flesh and living happily ever after. Uh, something that I shared a few weeks ago when I talked about the passage from 1 Peter, wives submit to your husbands, um, is, is this. And Todd really wanted me to share this again. And that is the fact that every couple that enters into marriage, both of them enter into that union with a picture in their mind of the perfect husband mm -hmm. or the perfect wife. The problem is we're imperfect people. That's right. 
we're not perfect, they're not perfect. So we're left with a decision, with a choice. We either have to tear up that picture that we have of the perfect spouse and embrace the person, or we keep the picture and tear up the person. And so it's very important for those of us who are married that we tear up those pictures today and start fresh. Mm -hmm. Embrace one another and extend grace and love towards your spouse. Be committed today, like Jose and Mari, that you're going to go the distance. You're gonna do what it takes to work through to a happily ever after marriage because it is God's heart for you and it is attainable for you. So what do we all need to do with this message today and beyond? Well, first of all, we've got to submit to God, the creator and the designer of mankind and of marriage. And we have to submit to his plan for marriage and throw out the lie that marriage is all about me. We've got to get rid of that today. And again, we can't emphasize this hard enough or long enough that you have to find your true identity in Christ and Christ alone. Look to him to meet your deepest needs. Second of all is we need to commit for life. True love really requires a commitment. Mm -hmm. I wanna say something to single people too. Todd's gonna to talk more next week about the selection process, but um, I told you I got radically saved uh, when I was 20 years old and my dad came to me and he, he said he was worried about me because he wanted me to meet a guy and get married. And he said, Kel, I'm, your mom and I are thrilled that you're in love with Jesus, but you're not gonna meet a man just going to school, going to work, going to church, and praying and reading your Bible all the time. That's what he said to me. So he encouraged me. He said, you, you know, just get out there and meet somebody. Go to the bars. And I was like, what? And he said, well, you don't have to drink. You don't have to get drunk. You can just go there and meet somebody. And I said, Dad, that's not the kind of man I want to meet. And for those of you, you single girls and single guys here today, don't go where the world goes searching for a mate. That's not the kind of man you want to meet and marry. And the same for you men. Look to God. Submit to God. And so I told my dad, I said, Dad, God is the one in control of my life. And if he wants me to get married, he knows where I am. And he knows how to get my future husband to me. And it wasn't very long after that I was, uh, I had moved to a different city and started attending a church where Todd happened to be the associate pastor. And I'd never heard him preach before. And I went on a Wednesday night and he was preaching. And I thought, this was the best preaching I'd ever heard in my life. And I had my mom on one side and my sister on the other, and I would grab my mom and say, isn't this awesome? And then I'd grab my sister, oh, isn't this amazing? And my sister, who wasn't even following God at the time, was just like, whatever, I just wanna get out of here. <laughs> and I went home that night, and Dad had stayed home uh, with my younger brothers, and I said, Dad, you missed it. This was the best preaching I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> and I re-preached the whole sermon to him. And then these words came out of my mouth. I said, Dad, that's the kind of man I want to marry. And as soon as I said it, I'd never even met him. I never one time listening to a sermon thought, I want to marry you. But those words just came out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaketh, is what the Bible says. And I did. <laughs> I met and married the man of my dreams. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is to those of you who are single and desire to be married, it's worth the wait. Wait for the right one. Mm -hmm. Wait for God's choice yeah. for you. And I know we're out of time. Third, realize that no matter how painful your marriage may be today, a great marriage is attainable. So we wanna pray for you before we leave today. So if you will, bow your heads together with us. And if you're with your spouse today, grab hold of his hand or her hand. Father, we come before you today acknowledging that you are God, that man is not God, and Lord, you're the creator and the designer of mankind. You're the creator and the designer of marriage. And Lord, today we choose to submit to you, to your will, to your way, to your plan, 
because we know, God, that you're God and we're not. You know the best way and you have the best plan for each of us. So we choose to submit to you and surrender to your Lordship once again. Lord, we pray for the singles here today, the singles that desire to be married. We pray that you would bring the right person into their life at the right time, but that first they would find their true love in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that they would find their completeness and their fulfillness, full fulfillment in Christ, in Christ alone, their true identity, and that you would bring that godly man, that godly woman at the right time so that they can better fulfill your will for their lives. And Lord, we pray for the married people here today that are struggling, that you would give them the faith and the hope to say yes to your will and yes to your way and no to divorce, that today they will say, I choose you today and for the rest of my life, that they will make the choice that Mari and Jose made and see their marriage become a great one. And we pray, God, for those who have good marriages, that their marriages would become better and that you would speak to them concerning struggling marriages in the church, that they would come alongside of those who are struggling to pray for them, support them, encourage them. And Father, we pray today for the divorced and the widowed. Lord, yesterday as I was reading in the Psalms and I read Psalm 147 verse three, I thought again of the divorced and the widowed, of those whose hearts have been broken because your word says that you heal the brokenhearted and you bind up all of their wounds. So according to your word, this is our prayer for them today, that every person that is here with a broken heart, that they would find their heart healed and restored through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I know today that there are some of you that aren't right with God, and, and you would like to have a relationship with Him or be made right with Him. So I'd like to pray with you today. Let's all have our heads bowed, eyes closed. And please pray this with me. Say, Dear God, Dear God, I know that I've sinned, I know that I've sinned and I know that I've failed. I know that I failed. But I believe that Jesus died in my place and that God raised him from the dead. And today, Jesus, I confess, your Lord, be Lord of my life. Please come into my life. Wash away my sin and give me the power to follow you. Amen. Now, if you pray to prayer like that, God's begun a good work in your life. And I'm going to ask you to reach in front of you and grab one of our connection cards. On the back of it, it says, I said yes to Jesus. If you'll fill that out, put it in the offering buckets as they go by. We'll be praying for you this week, or at the end of the service, there'll be prayer teams here at the front. If you bring them that card, they'll not only pray with you, but give you a gift to help you in your walk with God. So as we stand to our feet, let's give those folks a big hand today. Congratulate them. Also, if you're a newcomer, I want to remind you to take that card and let us know, fill out whatever information you're comfortable with, and put it in the offering bucket as well. We're getting ready to receive this morning's offering. We always want to do it with joy and gratitude to our great God. We're doing it today recognizing that everything we have came from Him, and we're just giving back to Him a part of what He's given us. So let's do that today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the opportunity to give. And we do so with joy and thanksgiving, with hilarity, with honor to you, the great God who's given us all things. And we give you honor, praise, and glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's do it.
couple here today and you want to come forward and pray together about some things going on in your in your relationship in your marriage we'd love to pray for you for those matters as well if you signed up for the ascent 101 class that's happening right after this service in fact in a, just a couple minutes you can begin making your way across the foyer and up the stairs to the x factory we'd love to meet with you and talk with you over there but let's make sure we are considerate of everyone that's coming forward for prayer this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. You are dismissed. i